Well, hello, everybody. My name is Fuzz Rana. I'm a biochemist and a, a Christian apologist, and I work for the organization called Reasons to Believe. And a few years ago, I, I wrote a book called Dinosaur Blood in the Age of the Earth. Uh, because I wrote this book, uh, people oftentimes will ask me about the Jurassic Park and the Jurassic World movies, and particularly, you know, are these scientifically accurate? Is this something that we could really accomplish? And the fact of the matter is, I've never watched any of the Jurassic Park or the Jurassic World movies. <laughs> And, you know, and, and I can understand the appeal that people enjoy watching uh, dinosaurs terrorize people. Boo! And there's a, a bit of an, a romantic uh, aspect to the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies, I'm sure, because a lot of people would imagine and wonder what it would be like to be able to actually see dinosaurs in real life. It's a dinosaur. Uh -huh. So I get it, but watching dinosaurs eat people just isn't my cup of tea. I must be scared myself. I didn't say I was scared. I didn't say you were scared. I know. Uh, uh, Brian and Sandra, the hosts of uh, the, our TV show, 2819, had a challenge uh, where they mentioned to the viewers that I had never seen any of the Jurassic Park or Jurassic World movies. If 50 people commented, Fuzzasaurus, that I would actually watch a Jurassic Park or Jurassic World movie and offer my running commentary on it. And so that's what we're doing today. Hopefully we'll have a good time. Yeah, this is a fun scene that I think does a great job of capturing the, just the, the uh, astonishment and the marvel of seeing a, a, a real live dinosaur for the first time. So now one thing that um, I've heard uh, paleontologists comment on about is the sound that the dinosaurs make. So this brontosaurus is making a roaring sound. Uh, most people uh, that are paleontologists think that dinosaurs would actually sound much more like birds screeching. And that roar is, is typical of what mammals would make, not what, again, bird, the sound that birds would make. And so again, because of that bird-dinosaur connection, people think that dinosaurs would have sound more like, again, screeching birds. We use the complete DNA of a frog to fill in the holes and complete the code. <laughs> the fact of the matter is the approach that the Jurassic Park scientists are taking would, would never work. First of all, uh, the insect or the, the mosquito that would be preserved in the amber would probably be preserved, although it probably would undergo some kind of chemical alteration. But the contents of the mosquito, including the blood that it presumably sucked from a dinosaur, would not be preserved. It would undergo uh, degradation uh, over, uh, over 70 million years. And if any kind of uh, soft tissue materials would have remained behind, they would be trace amounts of materials that would have undergone significant uh, diagenesis, would have undergone significant chemical alteration. So the likelihood of getting any kind of blood out of that kind of sample is essentially impossible, let alone recovering DNA. It's unlikely DNA would survive for 70 million years, although recently Mary Schweitzer claims to have discovered fragments, very small fragments of DNA in, in dinosaur remains that are about 70 million years ago. So even if they were able to recover trace amounts of DNA, it wouldn't be anywhere near an intact genome. It would just simply be uh, DNA fragments that again have probably undergone significant chemical alteration. Let's say you could then sequence some of that DNA. It probably would be ill-advised to use a frog genome to fill in the gaps. Uh, you would most likely want to actually use uh, genomes from an avian source, uh, most likely a, a chicken genome or something like that uh, to fill in the gaps because uh, today most uh, biologists believe that actually uh, birds are uh, dinosaurs, uh, that, that when they look at dinosaurs they classify them as non-avian and avian dinosaurs and um, the, the uh, avian dinosaurs, from an evolutionary perspective, would have given rise to birds today. Now, in all fairness, uh, what Michael Crichton has done, though, is really very good science fiction writing because he has, he has uh, used enough science 
to make what the Jurassic Park scientists accomplished seem to be scientifically plausible. He, he really, uh, again, uh, deviates really only a little bit from established science uh, to create kind of this science fiction scenario. So it's really very good science fiction writing that he's engaged in. The bread raptors. Yeah, velociraptors actually figure pretty prominently, as I understand it, in Jurassic Park. And the way they're depicted is actually much larger than they would have been in real life. Most velociraptors would have been about the size of a turkey, and they would have been feathered as well. A turkey, huh? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, what's interesting about this particular scene, too, is, is the, the perspective of, of Dr. Ian Malcolm, who... Uh, essentially is, is parroting the evolutionary mantra that, that life is able to evolve, that life is able to find a way, so to speak, through the evolutionary process. But if all of the, the dinosaurs are females, and there is absolutely no way they can reproduce, and actually reproduction is critical uh, to, the, to the, the way people envision the evolutionary process taking place, uh, is that organisms have to reproduce and it's essentially the heritable genetic variations that, if, if the, that are critical to the evolutionary process. But if these dinosaurs can't reproduce, then there's absolutely no way that evolutionary processes are going to somehow cause them to break free of the, of the controls that the, the Jurassic Park scientists put in place. Keep absolutely still. This vision is based on movement. This idea of, of keeping absolutely still to avoid being seen by the T-Rex, um, most paleontologists believe that, that dinosaurs, including T-Rex, would have had very good vision that would have been able to see uh, the people, whether they were standing still or whether they were moving or running around. Uh, and on top of that, T-Rex had an incredible sense of smell, according to paleontologists, that would have allowed the, the, the animal to be able to detect <laughs> the children and Alan Grant and Ian Malcolm, even if it couldn't see them. If you ever find yourself having to run away from a T-Rex, make sure you're running, not standing still, hoping it won't see you because you're just making its job easier. Come on, come on, come on, come on. We've got to get out of here. We've got to get out of here. T-Rex here is able to keep up, in fact, even outpace the, the Jeep as it's driving away. But most paleontologists think that, that T-Rex would have only been able to, to move at about 15 miles an hour, which is still a pretty fast clip for an animal that size, but it couldn't go uh, on the order of 30 or 40 miles an hour uh, to keep up with a Jeep. But again, uh, having T-Rex being able to run that fast just adds to the, the horror element of the movie. And again, you know, the Jurassic Park, Jurassic World movies are just simply not my cup of tea, but I can understand why people are so fascinated by these movies. And dinosaurs are remarkable creatures uh, that uh, lived on Earth, uh, gosh, 225 million years ago to about 65 million years ago, and uh, were really regal uh, creatures in their own right, and very much appreciate the, the, the movies. But if you are interested in, in learning more about an aspect of dinosaur paleontology that is uh, like science fiction come to life, uh, I would actually encourage you to take a look at my book, uh, Dinosaur Blood in the Age of the Earth. Uh, this is a book where we talk about the recovery of soft tissue remnants from dinosaur remains and explore the question, what do the, does this discovery mean uh, for the scientific dates for the age of the Earth and the age of life on Earth? So until next time, remember the more that we discover about science, the more that we have reasons to believe, even if some of our favorite science fiction movies aren't accurate.